From the cradle to the grave, you are measured against the yardstick of average, judged according to how closely you approximate it or how far you are able to exceed it. Our modern conception of the average person is not a mathematical truth, but a human invention, created a century and a half ago by two European scientists, Quetelet and Gorton, to solve the social problems of their era. It's what Todd Rose speaks about in his bestseller, End of Average. Juliana Jackson has dug deep into the minds of data analytics leaders, people that work every day with measurements and metrics, to uncover what mental models they have built to help them understand the world. Join us while we focus on the stories of data analytics leaders and how they use mental models to challenge others to think differently by deviating from conventional approaches. Maddie, nice to have you here, man. How are you feeling today? I'm feeling like I can really use the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> Same here. It's been one of those weeks, yeah. So you're my first guest in this podcast. I'm very excited that, you know, it's with you, the first uh, the first episode. Mostly I'm honored. You, I am honored. Let me Let me brag about you a bit. You have been inspiring me a lot in the last period with, you know, my my path and what I'm trying to achieve. So I'm really happy to have you here today to have a conversation about, uh, as I like to call it politely, academic shit. So you're saying on your LinkedIn bio that you help people make smarter decisions, which fits a lot with the narrative of this podcast. But tell me, how do you help people make smarter decisions? Like, how did you get into the analytics world? I think my bio is probably slightly outdated for me to write something like that. But fundamentally, I, that is kind of what I'm striving to do. I came into analytics probably like many people, just completely sideways. There's very few vertical ascension paths to analytics because the way that we teach and learn in primary school all the way up to secondary and, and even university doesn't really align with the things that people are doing today in in the analytics world entirely. If you if you look at like the the work that a data analyst is doing, where they have to know SQL, they need to know about marketing tools, they need to know about so many different things, and that that only comes from a sort of cross pollination of different things. So I came in completely sideways, pretty much at like warp nine because I finished university. I, I studied hospitality, which which basically just gives me that sort of service mindset. But after that, I went to the military and I was injured in the military and was suddenly found myself at home wondering what I should be doing. And so I started in, in the tech industry because I've always been passionate about technology. So I started at a recruitment company doing like all things tech related for them. That meant everything that involved a computer according to their definition. So that meant printing business cards but also redesigning the entire CMS to fit operational flows. And, and for someone fresh out of university, it was in the beginning very overwhelming and then got very boring because the tasks were very repetitive. The environment was, was pretty small. And I very quickly started learning that from all the things I was doing, I really enjoyed the numbers the most. I loved looking at how many CVs it took to fill a certain type of position. I started looking at breakdowns about which types of recruiters were performing better than others. And I realized that that's actually an entire field within itself. At the time, I didn't know that. I didn't know that analytics as a field kind of existed. So I started looking for jobs and I was taken a chance on for sure. And I'm extremely grateful for that because hiring someone at that point as a junior digital analyst, which was my title at the time, having no analytics experience whatsoever directly, understanding only the basics of what Google Analytics is, not even understanding how a tracking pixel even works. I failed in my interview completely to explain how a tracking pixel actually works. They still took a chance on me because they saw, I, I guess they saw that I was driven. And so I ended up in the web analytics world and like many others from the web analytics world, you kind of branch out eventually. And so I ended up doing FinTech, SaaS, 
which leads to you know business business intelligence or business information and lots of different systems connected together with a good splash of data engineering my first my first real touch points with sql you could say that's where i really fell in love with sql was at that time and then you know from there onto the media media company for a, a short stint of almost almost a year and now finding myself with my own startup of course all of those things are important I've, i'm wearing a lot of different hats at the moment but yes analytics is still very much part of my blood you can say were you ever asked to install Windows when you were working in the recruitment agency? One hundred percent of the time, <laughs> I was responding to support requests three a.m. on Saturday when the server would go down and and all these kinds of things. Yeah, been through the trenches. Damn. Um. Cool. So, like, tell me. I have a question. So, tell me, like, working with measurements and metrics every day does it change how you process everyday information in general outside your specialization i think it changes you it changes you more than you initially realize Tell i would say more. it affects it, it definitely affects two major aspects of your life one being all of the work that you do which isn't directly analytics related so when you start doing work whether it's whether it's like a side project or whether it's something you're just doing for fun you start to sort of look at things a lot more critically. Doesn't mean that you see things with a negative or positive light. You just start sort of challenging things a lot more and, and not taking everything at face value. And in your personal life, it I think it has a huge effect on how you perceive information in the real world when you're out shopping for groceries. You start looking at prices per kilo rather than just the price that's on the label because you understand the context of the information and you start comparing prices per kilo for onions and you go oh my god they're overcharging me for this four pack of onions because it's prepackaged. i'm paying for the convenience but i don't need to pay for the convenience so i think it has a profound effect on, on both of those aspects of your life do you build like you know coping schemas in your head to deal with you know situations that occur every day you know the the germane cognitive load when you're just building schemas to deal with everything that happens in your life do you, do you have that thing like when you see something happening you're you're like that meme with all the calculations behind and you're just trying to process you know what you will how will you, will you react to different things that happen to you yeah with the math flying by it's 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 really challenging i think this thing i struggle with most which i definitely have to learn how to deal with better is dealing with inaccuracies and and also people talking about numbers as if they know what numbers mean but then actually they have no idea about what they're actually talking about i think recently there's been a great example of on reddit of like the world's most boring jobs of data analysts is apparently top five but then the most exciting jobs in the world top one in the top five was also science so people don't understand that data science is actually a form of scientific research <laughs> just about human behavior a lot of the time but it's a form of science and i think that misunderstanding or that non-understanding of what we do is is the biggest struggle for me because i am really I, I struggle a lot to still explain to people what I do. I mean, my LinkedIn bio is probably a good example of that. Trying to help people make better decisions or smarter decisions is probably not the best description of what I'm trying to do. But how do you make people think like the whole, you know, purpose of, you know, mental models and schemas and whatever we are calling this, you know, behavioral science that we build, you know, through our jobs, through our specializations, through, you know, our own experiences how do you apply your skills in uh, data science or data analytics to help people you know think better because you have I to think like, that's the job of the analyst to make to help you know the company or their client or you know think better how do you do that how do you challenge that so i think 
yeah, I mean, obviously it depends on the context, whether it's, you know, I worked on agency side, I worked on client side, and now I'm working for my own company. So I kind of have all of the different perspective. I freelanced as well. The last three months of, of last year of uh, 2021, I was freelancing as well to bridge the gap between being employed and, and starting with our startup. So I, from all the different perspectives, the objective has always been the same, which is to educate and make people aware of how to work with data and how to work with people in data because it's it takes both it's not sufficient in my opinion to have someone who understands the granularities of you know GA4's model of okay this is you know these are users these are events or anything like that if they do not understand how to work with someone who's processing that data for them whether it's a data engineer whether it's a data scientist whether it's a data analyst or whatever title you want to slap on those people today that you need to have a fundamental understanding of the world of data and the, the thinking that's required, but also in the relationship. Got it. Do you think that a lot of times when we uh, are trying to make others understand something, when we're, when we're trying to help them or challenge them to think better, do you think we're uh, being very subjective or do you think we're being objective? I think we are always subjective. I think it's impossible for a human to be 100% objective. I think it's really necessary that we strive for objectivity, but ultimately you are seeing the world through your eyeballs and the way that you see the world, the way that your past experiences and your, your purely your genetic makeup and whoever makes who you are, your soul, etc., shapes how you view the world and thus shapes how you then ultimately explain things to people and i think that's also fine like that's part of life that humans are unique it's the sort of classic the classic meme with the fork there's three forks in a in a row on a table and then there's a fourth fork which is completely bent and screwed and and all like mangled up and the title was being unique doesn't make you useful and <laughs> Everyone, everyone is truly unique, but of course, you know, in a particular situation, some information might not be useful to someone. So it's up to you to decide what you think will be useful to that person. And then of course you come to the, the classic sort of crux of everything, which is communication, right? And as we know, communication has both a sender and a receiver. And although you output something in some way, the person who's receiving it might not receive it in the same way or they're most likely not going to receive it in the same way. And so even if you intended for a message to be conveyed in a certain way, it still might result in it being conveyed in a completely different manner. And so you have to battle with both of those things too. I remember when I uh, messaged you on LinkedIn some while ago to ask you about predictive CLV, and you told me that you can measure a lot of stuff. It doesn't mean it's going to be useful. So it's similar to, to what you were saying earlier. That was, I took that to with extent, me and I told yes. that to, yeah, I told, I told that to a, to a client and I, I kind of like stole that and I use it every time people want to measure some, some crazy, some crazy shit that is not useful necessarily. But go, let's go back to this subjective because you're getting into exactly what I want to, the sub subjectivity versus objectivity. So one of my favorite, I guess, mental models is the um, probabilistic thinking. So this is essentially trying to estimate using math, logic, and whatever the likelihood of some, you know, outcome is going to happen, like something is going to happen. Mm -hmm. so this is, our, as humans, this is one of our best tools to improve the accuracy of our decision making, right? So right now we're living in a world, a very fucking crazy world, right? And each Tell moment in this world, yeah, and each each moment of this world is determined by an infinite, right, complex of, you know, factors and so on. So it's very hard to actually depict what is the actual outcome. So, but we're, we're, we're being very hopeful and, and, you know, optimistic about things that are going to happen because even with ourselves, if we are trying to uh, be very optimistic with probabilistics, right? Like, it's probably going to be all right. It's probably going to be good. But I want to ask you, like, when we know, you know, like, 
I, actually, I think, I guess my question is like, do you use this type of mental model in differently because you come from a measurement and metrics world and to help, you know, people that you work with make better decisions? Well, ultimately, I think, I mean, my statistics background is definitely very weak compared to probably a lot of analysts who are working today full-time as analysts, which is also fine because my, my path is, is very different and everyone's path is different. But it does mean that the way that I approach math in general is probably very different than someone who would approach it who comes from a statistics background. And I think in terms of probabilities, I think someone like myself n knowing about knowing like the in depths of probability and knowing that flipping a coin is always 50 50 and and kind of that being top of mind certainly changes the way that you view statements like 70 percent of people do this it's like what was the sample size that's the first thing that we ask as an analyst and yet i think s people from other industries or, or people from other walks of life they don't ask this question they just accept that number at face value Truth, yeah. And and I think that that is a, a type of thinking that overall I think it helps people to think more in that way. To you know, they see the media run a poll saying you know sixty seven percent of people are in favor of this particular political initiative. Okay, but they only surveyed thirty thousand people. How big's the country? Seventy million. Is that really significant at that point? What 30,000 people think in a country of 70 million? Maybe not. Maybe not. And it, it's, it makes sense. You won't have the answer necessarily in front of your eyes. I mean, no one can do that kind of great math in their head most of the time. There are probably some savants who are able to. I certainly can't. And that's okay, too. But ultimately, <laughs> even knowing about that, even knowing that that exists is already bringing you one step further in your thinking, I think. I like that. So let's take a step back to what you were saying earlier and come back to this because I have, I, I'm trying to get you somewhere. I'm trying, this is me testing my hosting <laughs> capabilities. <laughs> my, that my probabilistic is 50-50 that this is going to work Coin somewhere here. So you said that you worked for a company, for a client, you even freelanced. But like when I met you, I, we met at uh, Steen's conference, remember, and you had your keynote before me and I was thinking, fuck, I cannot follow this <laughs> because like, I was looking at my presentation and then I was looking at yours and I was like, yeah, I cannot follow this. So then is when we actually, you know, got to know each other. And um, like, I just remember I was going on social media and then I read that you went on your own with uh, your uh, with your business. So what made you go and you know chase this this path and you know leave away like because it was comfortable for you like everyone knows you everyone knows you are who you are and i mm -hmm. think it would be comfortable for you to work in any fucking company as a product senior product analytics or senior data analytics like you would have it easy like that like what made you say you know fuck this i'm gonna go do my own thing which is infinitely hard like what was the probabilistics here like how did you how did you switch to that so strangely enough, and this probably doesn't play at, at all very well into your podcast at all, or, or the discussion that we're having around data analytics, this decision is based 100% entirely on gut feeling and, and, and emotions, let's say, because there is, having been a founder now officially for something like three months, almost exactly to the day, but... Yeah having been involved in this side hustle for probably close to nine years now, I can pretty safely say from my experience that there is no mental model that will prepare you for what it's like to be, to found your own business. And I think most people, whether it's a one man show doing an established business that already exists over the years, like a service type model thing, like an agency, or whether it's something completely far fetched, like what we're doing with cook eat, I think the, the, the end result is the same. There's a certain amount of information you can rely on, I don't know, studies or information about the market or actual data that you've collected from people, but ultimately that decision is extremely personal. And in my particular situation, 
I've worked together with my co-founder now for almost nine years. We've been effectively side hustling and we took the decision to go all in for a variety of reasons, but the ultimate reason being we need to know if it works or not. That we cannot continue the way that we were continuing in this side hustle mode because the, the growth wasn't there. We weren't able to devote the time that it actually needs as a project. And therefore we decided to go all in and we got, we got the investment. We got the, let's say enough time. I don't know, but we got a certain amount of time that we can buy ourselves to work full time on the project. And so that decision was not made. Ultimately the investors at that stage, they're not even investing in the idea. They're investing in you as a team and what you believe to be possible. There's very few numbers. There's very few things you could actually show on a slide to convince investors at that point. I mean, everybody knows the pre-seed slides. So we only need 1% of this massive bubble to be profitable. And of course we showed something along those lines too, but ultimately it comes down to the people and trust in whether you think those people are going to deliver on that or not. Performing. I don't know how to measure trust. I don't think anyone has truly figured out how to measure trust by now. Trust is very deceiving. Yeah, but I think you know, when you're having a strong individuality, I think that can uh, convey and help. Go ahead, go yeah, ahead. The, they always say with trust, right? It takes forever to build and an instant to break. So it's very, yeah. it's very fickle. So this was an emotional decision, an individual decision, a decision between you and your partner because you really wanted to have evidence that this works. If you invest basically more time and you know become dedicated to this versus having it as a side hustle. Correct. Yeah. So exactly. how would you? How do you think? How do you think in general? How would? How do you? And how do you think society defines individuality? Well, you're really putting me on the spot with that kind of question. <laughs> I mean, yeah, um, because you made an you said you made an emotional decision, and also like a hundred percent of our emotional decisions have everything to do with who we are as people and how we're built. And I just want to know what's your definition, because everyone has their own definition, probably. I'm really curious to see by the end of this season what these people's definitions about um, individuality. So how would you define it and how do you think society defines uh, individuality? I would say, I mean, I visually, I kind of think about this in a sort of spider diagram kind of way or radar chart, as it's often called, where... <laughs> The, the human is composed of many different dimensions. There's probably on a typical radar chart or, or spider diagram, there's probably something like five to eight different categories. And I think humans probably have something like upwards of 300 different aspects or something that you could probably map various values to. And the main problem I think with that visually is that there's no such thing as a universal scale of zero to 10. Like how, how do you come up with Let's, let's talk about trust. Let, let's say trustworthiness is one of those axes. Then, okay, what's zero and what's 10? Does a 10 trustworthiness mean the person has never betrayed you yet? Or does it yep. mean the person did betray you and then they told you about it? Like, it's so subjective. And so the rating of individuality or even coming up with some kind of framework to measure individuality is I think inherently impossible. Of course, we would love to try. We would probably love to try and do it, right? Humans love to measure everything, but I think it's not possible. And I think it's not even desirable. I think ultimately individuality is represented through the person reflecting on others. And of course that in itself is a collation of all of the people's representations of that person. And I guess at that point you start talking about sort of self-image versus 
the image that others see you by. And I think uh, classically, there's probably four, right? There's the image that you project internally that you think that you are, the image that you consciously then project that the you, that you are have. exactly the, the others that think that you have, and then the others that they perceive or something like this. There's basically four, four that? dimensions. Was it Nietzsche? Was it Nietzsche that said that? Who said that? I forgot. I'm not even sure, but it, yeah, it's one, one of the sort of core frameworks around sort of self. Yeah, I don't remember where Nietzsche. I have it from. It was Sartre. I think it was Sartre because he was. Could have been Jean Paul Sartre, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's why I, I read that. But so you are saying that the way to determine someone's individuality is by looking at a group and c c compare that person with the group. I mean, what else do you have other than saying that there's nine billion permutations of humans currently? What what other choice do you have other than segmentation? So let's let's play a game. So let's say, you know how everyone likes to define themselves. I'm a strong, independent woman. I am, you know, hilarious. I am whatever. Like everyone wants to like, let's talk about those definitions. And I'm, I know I'm going to piss people off with this, especially Tay. Tay, if you're listening to this, I'm sorry. But you know those tests, uh, personality tests, right? <laughs> when you find out oh, yeah. you're an extrovert. I, I cannot even say those acronyms, ENTJ. Or ENTG yeah. or INTG. So that's that's so, Myers Briggs, right? That one. That yeah, Myers Briggs. Framework. Thank you. Yeah. So how do you, you know, like I want to talk a bit about this. There's so many people that are taking all these tests because they want to. Try, they're trying to define themselves because everyone desperately wants to be different, but at the same time, everyone desperately wants to fit in. So <laughs> the whole shebang of this. So, but the results of these tests that someone takes online is just comparing an individual score to an average score. And how can we identify someone's individuality when we're looking at averages? Because, and I wrote down this because I really want to say this right, the concept of average is like a yardstick for measuring individuals, right? Based mm -hmm. on you know, the average man, the average, how the average man or the average woman or them or they can be. It's so thoroughly ingrained in our minds since we were born that we really, 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 you know, we are very rarely questioning the concept of average. So the moment when we are born and we're going to kindergarten, we are trained to be workers and we're trained to be part of society. We're trained to not deviate from the uh, from the average. And this is something that in school happens, like all the school tests, the exams, like we are just, you know, we're measured based on an average. So it doesn't matter if someone is an individual talented person, if their score, like when I, when I took the baccalaureate a thousand years ago, my grades were shit. No one was thinking like, oh my God, she can do a lot of stuff. But look, I did, you know, my baccalaureate, I took, I barely got five in maths, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but look, I'm doing, I'm doing, you know, I'm working in technical marketing, so it doesn't really reflect who I am as a person. So what I'm yeah. like, I like, don't get me wrong. <laughs> Averages are useful when you're looking at, I don't know, population or you're looking, you know, like, uh, like for instance, with the vaccines, like look how, you know, the average people are vaccinating themselves. Like you can look at averages like that, but like when you want to find yourself or you want to find, you know, your individuality, if you're um, defining yourself based on an average score or on a test online, even if it's Meyer Briggs, even if it's a big sample size, is it really accurate for you to define yourself based on averages, like comparing yourself with an average? Really curious what you think. So this is a, it's a great question because it goes into one of sort of my core beliefs about individualism in general, which is people strive for the most part to want to put themselves into boxes because it makes it easier for other people to understand who you are. That's why job titles yeah. exist. Now, people like myself, I would say I'm one of the few people, at least statistically, or that I've come across, who flat out kind of reject this type of thinking. I do not like categorizing myself. I do not like putting myself into any kind of boxes. 
or or labels. For sure, there are labels that make sense. I'm a man biologically. I identify as he him. There, are, those are things that make sense. What doesn't make sense is to say I test badly. You were talking before about about baccalaureate. Across my entire educational path, I tested probably in the lowest ten percent of the class. Is that representative of my intelligence? Probably not. I'd like to think, at least, not that it isn't. Well, how do you um, think it is? Because you need a baccalaureate diploma to get to a college. This is yeah, and this I mean that that conversation goes down a path of you know is education the right system? Even though it's the same that it's been for 150 years and everything else has changed, we still put kids in rows in classrooms despite the fact that they don't need to work in a factory, so they don't really need to know what a row is like because that was the original reason that kids sat in rows in school so that they could simulate what it's like being in a factory where they're standing at the conveyor belts. But anyway. What I would say to sort of to close to close the loop on the sort of categorization, people on the other hand also want to shine through individually, right? And that's not possible with boxes, but people find it communicationally or or difficult to communicate with other people about all of the different aspects about who they are in a condensed format. And I think this is what it comes down to: is com it's a compromise because. People want to get to know each other, for example, in a, in a classic situation where two people meet at a bar. We're obviously talking post-COVID here where people aren't concerned about uh, meeting in person. And, and two people meet in a bar, they don't know anything about each other. They come from entirely different walks of life. And those two people begin talking. They ask what you do for work. And the person will answer something along the lines of their job title or, or something similar, like, I am an insurance broker. And the other person might say, I am a nurse at a hospital. And that, that label serves as a roll-up of many different criteria and beliefs. And at that point in time, what you're doing is condensing information for the other person. Rather than telling the other person, daily, I work in a high-stress environment where I'm generally putting needles in people's arms and cleaning up pee and poo, you're saying you're a nurse. And I think it all depends on your individual decision about condensing information. I would prefer to not do it that way. I would prefer to say everything. But ultimately, time is our greatest enemy. And so we find ways to save time by condensing information down into these labels or, in the case of personality tests, condensing our self into these boxes where we then use these boxes and labels to tell other people i'm an infj which means i don't do this very well and i think the biggest trap around that is not the condensing of information you could argue that yes testing against an average yields a certain amount of inaccuracy that's definitely true i think the greater problem is that people then try to let themselves be defined by that label or box. I'm an INFJ, so I don't do this very well, is something that you read very commonly after people have taken these personality tests. Or I'm a, I'm a marketing analyst, so I don't do technology very well. I don't understand data technology. And I think that is the biggest inhibitor when it comes to these labels and boxes. That's so true. My my husband is into what do you call it? Human design. And human design okay. is basically yeah, like he he's like super fascinated. And there's like this different type of people like manifester, generator, uh, whatever. You know, like there's these categories. He's super into it. And like he thinks that thing like so religiously. So when my, my baby was born, my two-year-old was born, he went and did the test on him to see what type of human design the baby has. And I'm sorry for if, if you listen to this, Shay, and I know you listen, but like how the fuck do you know about a baby if he's going to be a manifester from like just because of his birth date? It's like, it's, it's like that baby didn't even have a chance to be and exist. And it's like, it means that he, and he was saying, this means he's going to lead groups and make friends fast. Maybe he doesn't like nobody, you know, maybe he's not going to mm. do that. And it's like, 
we're going so crazy with this boxing thing that we do really believe it and we do really follow it. And I did it too. Everyone, I think, did it in the past when you would take a test and you, you know, I found out I was, I took this test a while back. I don't remember. I think it was the strength finders test. And in the strength fighters, uh, finders, I was told that I'm a very good orator. I don't think I am. Like sometimes I might be. But that's not something I want to be in my life. You know, I'm, I would love to get to a point where I don't really have to do any more marketing stuff because I got bored of it. I'm sorry, but it's true. I really got bored of marketing as do you think, it is. Do you think marketing so is, I, is entirely reliant on something like that skill? No, but you would think that. Because you're told that, you know, it's exactly as you are saying, like you, you are a digital marketer or you're a marketer and you cannot do technical stuff. And I know people that do not want to learn technical skills because you think this is it, this is who I am. And if that would have been my case here, I would have said, you know, like I'm a good, I'm a good evangelist. I'm a good product evangelist. Why do I need to learn SQL right now? You know, that's, mm -hmm. that's what I am. But Absolutely. we do use this and it's and I see people limiting themselves and their lives because they just believe this. So I want to ask you, can you think about other example when we, examples of when we, we are using group values to define someone? I think a really easy one to pick out is um, in Switzerland, we are every male under the age of 18 is required, over the age of 18, is required to do military service. And the way that they test in the military, part of it is psychological uh, and part of it is, and if you don't pass the certain physical thresholds, then you cannot do, you cannot be active in certain parts of the military. Very simply, if you don't get, I don't know, score out of four, four out of eight or four out of nine on the base, I don't know, marathon or something, then you cannot go into infantry because it requires a lot of running or something like this. And what we fail to forget is that the time of the test plays an extremely important role because that test can occur three years before someone actually starts their military service. That test can occur two months before someone starts their military service. And so in my case, I tested when I was 23 after having done university versus someone who's 18 or 19 before they've even gone to university, they will be in a different physical state than yeah. someone who's four or five years later. And ultimately I scored very poorly on the physical exam, despite not necessarily wanting to score poorly on, on the physical exam. But that meant that some of my options were then not available to me. And whether that makes sense for the military or not is not for me to question. I do not understand military strategy. What I do understand is that in a company, if a company decides to give a take-home test to 50 people, and then based on these take-home test results, basically fundamentally deny half of those people a chance at something because they score it a certain way, we should definitely question that approach. And we should ask ourselves, are we actually, this comes back to the individualism, are we actually thinking about the individual here? What are we, is this approach, is this approach sensible for recognizing that everybody is different, recognizing that everyone tests differently, recognizing that people digest and output information differently? And so I'm, I'm a big fan of, companies now saying, this is the information we would like to have. This is the, the things that we require and what we want to know to be able to take a decision on whether we move forward with your application in a, in a job hunting process. These are the three ways that we could do that. Do you prefer A, B, or C? What's more comfortable for you? And this, these are companies that are hiring the megaton. Like we are talking big, big, big companies doing this because the more that we don't do that, the more we fall into this treating everybody the same, putting everyone into boxes, putting everyone with a particular label. And all that does is hold people back, in my opinion. It does. And on this topic, on moving a bit more on individuality, 
when from a statistical point of view, when something is below average is considered an error, right? Or a deviation. And when something is above average is considered a win is, or, you know, Galton, the guy that invented Mm -hmm. eminence and mediocrity is called is something, you know, big. Like, what do you think about that? Because everyone is fucking terrified. God forbid they are mediocre or average and everyone is just trying to be excellent or eminent. But even like if I would make before I uh, let you, you know, say your, uh, you you know, what, what do you think about this? Even if we look at tools and technology and data analytics, we're dealing with a lot of averages. And a lot of times the juices and the actual cool shit is in the errors and deviations is not in the averages or above averages because those are the most... I guess, deceiving metrics. So what do you think about this, both in work and both in, you know, real life? Yeah, I think I have have two two aspects of that I would, would talk about. I think we catch ourselves, e- even in data analytics, like I did a SQL assessment. I think it's the same one that you did recently. I did a SQL assessment on DataCamp last year. And they told, they told me, DataCamp told me that I scored in the 94th, percentile which which meant that i scored better than 94 percent of other people who took the test and i immediately perceived that result as okay cool i am better than 94 percent of other people who took this test but that's such flawed thinking because i don't know the other people who've taken that test i have no idea what their background is maybe all the other people who've taken that test have been working with sql for three months in which case that test in terms of approximating my skill level is somewhat redundant because we're not comparable. And I think that's yeah. the, the kind of what they're trying to avoid, right? They only offer the test to people who've done the SQL fundamentals course, right? To, you know, to ensure that there's some level of, of uh, yeah, levelness or equilibrium for the people taking that test, right? And of course, someone who comes along like myself with, you know, I don't know, five or six years of SQL writing under my who decides to do the fundamentals course as a bit of a refresher or for whatever reason and who decides to take this test yeah for giggles it's probably not going to be representative and i made that same mistake that i saw that label and immediately applied it to myself and i reflected on that a little bit later in the sort of weeks afterwards and said (laughs) yeah and i guess you're also going through that reflective stage now thinking about well why am I comparing myself? Why why even bother? Like, am I just happy fundamentally with my score? Because the score just tells you, you got this many out of this many right. And that would yeah. already be enough information for us to say, these are the types of errors you made. These are the types of errors you need to work on. Okay, you didn't, you didn't write this case when statement correctly, or you didn't apply the min function correctly or whatever. That would be a sufficient amount of information for us to improve, to improve Our ourselves. Soul. Yeah. And but we, we don't like care about the others. others, but we, but like we to have to know, now. we have to know we're good <laughs> at something. That's right. And that's what I mean about the second. So in the second thing I wanted to mention was about deviation. So in this case, I definitely deviated. Right. And what's, what's great is that the, the great examples of looking at things that are not there is the very famous image, which I think is making the rounds again on LinkedIn and stuff with the the planes in World War II that returned to a base with bullet holes in their wings. And the engineers firstly assumed that they should start reinforcing those parts with all the bullet holes in them. And then somebody pointed out, these are only the planes coming back all the ones that crashed, they had bullet holes somewhere else because they crashed. And this was such an eye-opening thing because, you know, they were like, okay, so actually the ones coming back with bullet holes in this part actually means that the reinforcement is good enough in those parts. It's the other parts, which isn't good. And so they took the opposite decision of what was presented to them by the data. In this case, if you had said, show me the average spot of the bullet holes, it would have shown you the middle of the wing or whatever. And where they had to look at the exact opposite for the actual outcome. And so deviation or even 
disregarding the average completely is sometimes necessary. And that's where basically the other component of, of, of data analytics comes into play for me, which is context. Context, context, context. And I, at every point that I talk to someone, whenever it's in an educational context, <laughs> pun intended, I always, always mention you can only know so much theory and so much actual code and so much about a certain topic and technical things. If you know nothing about the context, you will, it's basically like flipping a coin at that point because you're, you're, you have a 50% chance to completely miss the mark on what it is. And I think this has changed. This has changed my thinking a lot recently, this understanding of how important context is. I can give you a very concrete example as well. My, my co-founder asked me a question about bringing out dates from the database about who, um, about one of our cooks who cooked when and, and where. And I said, sure, I, I can do that. And I immediately jumped to execution mode where I started bringing out that information. And then we were doing that and it doesn't take very long. And what followed was, oh yeah, and actually I'd like to do that for this other cook as well. And oh, maybe this other cook as well. And suddenly I realized that I had made one of the biggest flaws in my own, you know, in my own way, which is I had forgotten to ask about context, which was in this case would have been the question, do you need this for all of the cooks or just this one? And if I had asked that simple question, we would have saved ourselves a couple minutes of time. And it's not a big deal at that point. But when you start summing all of that time that you spend not researching context, it starts to make a really big difference and a really big dent in budgets, in my opinion. Yeah, and in the you know, in the outputs and the outcomes as well, because you're you know you're uh, leaking time, you're leaking energy, you're leaking focus. Like there's so many things that come into play. Context is absolutely everything, in general. Even you know we're talking analytics, marketing, technology. Context is everything, and I'm not saying averages are not important. It's just they're not gonna help you define just one person so you cannot look at an average to define a person i guess my last question for you because we touched upon it a bit based on what we talked about it how do you see the future of uh, education based on the standardization covenant under you know which we are under for so many years hundreds of years do you think we're educating our kids for the future or we're educating them for the past because we're teaching them shit that worked 100 years ago or 50 years ago. How do you think we're preparing them for the future? It's almost like I've asked you to give me this question, and which, which to be fair, we did not. We had not discussed me giving you this question. You, you recommended that, that we should talk about this question, and I wholeheartedly agreed because I love this question, because it plays into... Something that I talk about a lot, which is basically where we are today, we went through three huge transformative stages as society. We went through the industrial age initially, where we learned to create machines. We went through the age of digitization, where we started to adopt technical practices that we see today as normal, like calling someone on a video call. And the next phase for me, has only one word and that is personalization we are entirely as a society focused on personalizing every single aspect of everything that we do whether it's a company marketing its products whether it's someone deciding on which dress to wear whether it's someone deciding where to send their kid to school and what shocks me is that how many people, in my opinion, have not understood that this is the phase that we are currently in? There's a lot of labels. There's a lot of sort of hype terms that get thrown around, around Web3 or crypto, NFT, like tons of things, blockchain. Like there's a lot of terms being thrown around. Ultimately, all we're gearing towards is an era of personalization. 
because every that's what people want they want to be this comes back to individualism again everyone wants to be considered for who they are which means recognizing that their preferences are unique which means that if we want to know how to best serve that person in our online shop they probably have to log in because we're otherwise not going to know enough information about who they are or have enough certainty and so in the educational aspect you know given the fact that i've been live streaming on twitch now for a little bit over a year and a half almost which which i would describe my content as edutainment because i do try and educate at the same time as having fun because i do think those things belong together looking at our educational system i think it's completely broken because it's not personalized and i think that's the the biggest problem with it is that whether it's whether it's only considering the past too much or whether it's not considering our current state or the future enough that's very difficult for me to say i'm not you know deeply familiar with every nation's particular education plans and i'm sure that there's tons of people all over the world working to create an educational system that is as good as possible for for kids and for adults ultimately but what's missing for me is the personalization aspect because not everybody learns the same not everybody digests information the same not everyone outputs and retains information the same way and therefore pulling people into some kind of bucket or program based on oh these are all the people that want to learn javascript let's all teach them javascript this way for me doesn't account for that individuality enough and so i don't know what a future looks like with a perfect education system i think that's something that the people who are deeply ingrained in the current education system could probably come up with better than i could but i do know that the perfect education system would account for the fact that everybody is an individual and that everybody is different and i do believe very firmly that putting all the kids together in a room and sitting them in rows and teaching them something from a slide that was designed 20 years ago with information is has its limited usefulness i do i do definitely believe that that being said maybe it's a huge mistake maybe education as a whole is just our way of coping and saying well the first third of your life you basically spend it in debt anyway because you know up until the age of 12 you're basically non-productive for society anyway so we might as well do something with you so why not just send you to some institution that people pay for through taxes but maybe that entire system is just completely broken maybe the entire the entire welfare and state sort of run system of education maybe everything should be privatized maybe it's not a solution to have a system that sh is in place for everyone you know here in switzerland i am not deeply familiar with the legal situation around homeschooling but i do not think that it's pretty easy to do but why aren't we giving parents the decision to do, to teach their child yeah. or children the way that they want to it seems like state or society taking decisions about other people's lives is something that fundamentally people tend to disagree with that's why the the death penalty is pretty much non-existent in most countries with some major exceptions of course so i think this ties into for me the idea of individuality and decision making and information and i think it's very difficult to generalize and i think that's very difficult to do in, in, in general it's very hard to make sweeping statements but i do believe that the education system as a whole is built for the past and not built for the future i agree one more thing that i would add to what you said is, is this guy called christopher lockhead the guy with category design that wrote play bigger and he was he released this ebook and he was saying that the people that build the education uh, system are analog natives they're not digital natives but all the kids that are born and have been born in the last years maybe like the last decade are born into a digital world they're not born in, into an analog world like i'm looking at my son that's two he has a whole different type of I guess, environment that he was brought into versus my son that's 10 that had time to go in the park and play with kids that did the rows at the school. But like 
Eric, my my youngest, he he's really born in a world where everything is going digital and is fastly going digital. So it's a very big difference from us that we actually went through the whole shebang of communism in my case and wars and you know whatnot versus mm-hmm. these kids that are protected. So like the school was made by older people than us, older than our parents, right? So yeah. What Absolutely. are we getting this digital native kids ready for? So I like the way, I like how what you're talking about with personalization. I think it's an awesome point. And I think it's a good place for us to, you know, like leave this conversation in. Thank you so much for coming. This was awesome. Tell people where they can find you and follow you and watch your show on Twitch. The easiest way to find me is to go to Maddie2.shoes. And yes, it is actually the shoes top level domain that I bought as part of a joke. But that is my online handle, Maddie2shoes. So if you just type in your browser, Maddie2.shoes, you will reach my personal website. And from there, you'll find most, most of the things. And if not, you can surely find me via the most common social media channels. Thank you, everyone, for listening.